This is the next Bite of Life podcast, the place to be to hear personal stories from expats, digital nomads, and everybody else taking their next bite of life. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's episode of the Next Bite of Life podcast. My name is Kem Kem. Today, I have a very interesting guest who's going to tell us all about life in France and how she got there and everything else that's, you know, from beginning to end. So I, I present to you, Alison Lunes. Hi, Kem Kem. I'm glad, glad to be here today. Thank you for coming on. You know, I am so excited to hear your story because, you know, as you know, the, the podcast is for people who are willing to take chances and, you know, go on to new lives. And I love to hear all about it. So let's start off by asking you, where are you right now? I am in a town called Villemomble, which is about 15 minutes outside of Paris. Uh, where I have lived, I've lived in this particular town um, for about five years, but I've lived in the Paris area since 2009. Wow. So, you know, I guess maybe let's go back to the to the very beginning. You're originally from the U.S., right? Yes, I'm originally from Boston. And <laughs> I went to school in Boston. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm from Braintree, the end of the red oh, line. Oh, yeah. I've been there. I went to, to school right in the city. So I'm like for 10 years until the snow finally got me. And I said, oh, forget that. I'm, I'm out of here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so wait a minute. You, you grew up in Boston. And how does a girl from Boston end up? Like, were you always interested in travel? Like what picked your interest as far as like looking for a different life? I was. So my aunt is a scientist and she is a professor at Olin College um, in the Boston area. And she actually did a postdoc um, in the early 90s when she came to Paris to work in a lab for a year. I don't remember like how she got interested in French and mm -hmm. why she wanted to come to France. But basically, um, she came, I was about six or seven years old, was just enamored with the idea of Paris. And, yeah. you know, she brought things and she brought... Um, one thing I remember she brought back is she had these little crystallized violet um, candies from, which Ooh. are originally from Toulouse. Uh -huh. She had these on her bookshelf in her apartment in Boston after she came back. And yeah. we would go over there, my sister and I, for sleepovers. And I remember like these candies were so beautiful and precious and we could only have one and they were really tiny <laughs> so you you could wait to go to your aunt's house huh <laughs> yeah yeah and she like taught us words of, and she taught me words of french and i just thought this was like the coolest thing ever oh wow. um so that kind of got me started and then i started learning french in middle school you know oh. just uh just as part of the regular school curriculum okay and I was just like in love and I thought it was the coolest thing that you could learn how to say things in another language and I thought French was so beautiful and poetic and I loved how it sounded yeah um and I loved reading the little prince and I don't know I just I was in love <laughs> Oh, that sounds absolutely <laughs> wonderful because I think, you know, I, I learned French in school, but, you know, of course you never use it, but to actually get to use it further and down the line. So you were in school learning French and you had all this French um, influence from your, from your aunt. And so that got you into France itself? Or did you say, I just want to travel? Was it more like a, you had an idea and that was it? Or it was kind of well, like... I continued, so I, I loved learning French and I was taking French classes all through, um, all through high school. Um, I was like the sole active member of our French National Honor Society. <laughs> They're like, just let her at it. <laughs> well, cause like, in, I mean, in Boston, there's all of these, like there's the French library, there's the French cultural center, yeah. there's a French consulate, like there's, and there's a relatively large French community. So they had like all these activities. And so I was like, um, you know, organizing field trips for the <laughs> honor society members to like, go see the little prince, the opera in, in Boston, uh -huh. like, you know, at the, at, at the theater in Boston. Yeah. And of course, like I was the only one who went. So it yeah. was just being like me and the French teacher. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, so I was like super enthusiastic about everything. And uh-huh. then I continued, like when I went to, when I went to college, I was, um, I, I took a bunch of French classes. I always knew I wanted to study abroad. Okay. And so my junior year, I came, um, I was at Columbia University and they have a program in Paris at Reed Hall. And oh. so I did that program and I was in Paris for one year. Oh, nice. And it was basically like everything I had dreamed of. Like I had a, I had a small apartment where I could walk a hundred feet out the front door and stand <laughs> in a, and, and like stand in a place where I could see the Eiffel Tower sparkle at night. And I did that wow. like almost every night. Exactly. And, <laughs> um, and I just, and I just loved it. And it was a small program and I felt like, really close to and really supported by the administration in the program. You know, it was five, um, I think five women at the time who were running this program. Mm -hmm. And I felt like not weird for the first time for like being so into the French thing. Yeah. Um, And they really supported me in like taking all the classes I wanted to take at the French university and having all of these opportunities. But at the time, I didn't really know, you know, how it was going to affect my life. And I just yeah. thought, well, you know, I, I, I spent the I spent the second semester basically thinking, OK, how am I going to get back here? Like, I have <laughs> to go. I have to go back to New York to graduate. Yeah. And then what? Like, how do I get back to France? OK. And so I, you know, brainstormed all these ideas with my tutor. Mm-hmm. And um, I started putting together an application for a Fulbright scholarship to okay. continue a research project in France. Now, what I didn't know at the time is Fulbright doesn't like to send you back to a country where you've already studied. Ah. So, um, so like I had this super amazing project. I like the guy at Columbia the, in the advisor office, like told me it was one of the best projects that I'd ever seen. And it just didn't make it even out of committee because, mm-hmm. um, because yeah, Fulbright just doesn't. I, I learned this much later that they yeah. just don't support projects if you already speak the language and you've already studied in the country. Yeah, you know they want to send you somewhere else. Exactly, it doesn't make it a hardship enough, right? <laughs> right, right. So um, what I ended up doing was I just applied to a master's program independently. Okay. Um, doing the project that I had put together for the Fulbright, I just did it as a research project as a as a master's thesis, basically. Ah. And I supported myself by, at the time, you could apply for TEPIF, the teaching assistant program in France, okay. um, even when you were a student. So I had done that during my study abroad year. I had mm-hmm. taught English in French elementary schools, and then I applied to do it again uh-huh. um, when I came back to France. So that's, you know, a 12 hour a week job. And I basically did that plus the master's program during so, the first yeah year that I was back. That's fantastic. So you really, I mean, you were determined and this is something that I'd like to point out that you were determined to do it and you found ways, even when there was an obstacle in front of you, you found how to circumvent that and do something wise, which is what I always encourage people to do because you can come up with a million excuses why it's not the right time. I don't have the right money. Blah, blah, blah. You know, there are a million excuses if you want them. But here you are, you're saying, I, I couldn't do it the way I wanted and get this grant, but yet I managed to do it another way. And so, you know, you triumphed. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's important to point out. And I, and I always tell people like, you know, there's always a lot of things that are not going to work out. Like one of the things it's impossible to find housing in Paris. I'm not sure what the housing situation is in Spain, but in Paris and a lot of um, big cities, like it's really hard to find a place to live, especially if you're a student and you're foreign and you don't have family in France who can guarantee that you'll pay your rent or a paycheck um, yeah and you're earning <laughs> and you're earning 8 and you're earning 800 euros a month yeah um the, the and the studio costs 700 euros a month <laughs> yeah. um <laughs> it's like so, really singing um, for your supper right <laughs> yeah yeah so i mean i you know was determined to come i said like even if i have to set up a tent under a bridge i don't care i'm getting exactly. back to paris yeah and i ended up finding um i also did the summer program at middlebury college french language school language okay. school and okay. they had a program in paris and so i reached out to them when i was a student and i said look i'm moving to paris too i know i'm not in your program 
but, but do you have any extra housing? <laughs> and they actually, you know, after they had found housing for all of their students, they came yeah. to me and they said, actually, we do have this place. Do you oh, um, wow. want it for this year? So that was really, and it was such a deal too. It was, um, I want to say like 300 euros a month oh in, for a little studio. Oh. And it was a studio owned by another a family, um, a Franco American family. Mm-hmm. And basically, you know, I picked up the, I picked up the young, uh, the young son. He was like 10 at the time. So I picked mm-hmm. him up after school, made yeah. them snack, helped them with their homework. Yeah. But it wasn't really like being an au pair, you know, yeah. he was older. He was older. It wasn't like babysitting. It exactly. was just like, yeah. you know, feeding them, I think. So, <laughs> That's great. Wow, that yeah. was really a deal. You really, you really were Emily in Paris, but you actually knew French. And <laughs> wow, kind that- of, kind of. So, I mean, I learned. I had a master's level of like written French when I came to Paris, mm-hmm. and I knew how to say exactly nothing useful ah. because <laughs> when you learn like academic French, you know you're, it's you're true. learning like symbolism in you know, Zola or <laughs> Yeah, it's very <laughs> <Like> true. <laughs> when to use when to use the passé sample and how to conjugate, you know, the plus que parfait, but you don't actually like know how to say useful things like yes. you know, where can I plug in my telephone? Exactly. Or, <laughs> <laughs> the electricity went out in my apartment and I don't know how to fix the circuit breaker. <laughs> so like, you were like Marcel Marcel. You were like with the with, with, you know, I still do that all the time. You talk with your hands and I'm just like, you know, in my head I'm thinking, please understand what I'm saying. You know, I'm trying to say it in Spanish, but I don't get it. You know? So yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's funny, it's funny, like you can't see me, but I'm actually like making hand gestures. <laughs> <laughs> as I'm saying these things yes <laughs> but you survived you, you you did it you know I did it and now I know how to say and now I know how to say all of those things in French exactly. and I have a use for like all of those all of those vocabulary lists that we had to memorize like senior year of high school where like our teacher wanted us to learn how to how to say like all of the different types of spices that exist or all of the oh different my. types of trees yeah and I was like if the French AP exam like have a tree on it, I'll say it's a tree. They're not going to care. Exactly. Say, like, what kind? It's a, right. Like it's a cherry tree. It's an oak tree. It's a it's a pear tree. Like I I wouldn't even know how to identify those trees in English if there's exactly. no exactly. Awesome. <laughs> You're like it's not going to affect my life. But see, I'm too glad you know them now because now you can go and say yes, we oui, we oui, it is a tree of uh, you know it's yeah, red. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Now, when you went back, okay, after your year and you went back to Paris, now, did you ever say at that point, I'm in Paris, I want to stay here forever or indefinitely, at least at that point? Or did you think you're going back home? I went back to Paris with the idea that I wanted an option to stay long term if I decided that's what I wanted. Like okay. I wasn't sure at the time okay. that I wanted to stay long term, but I wanted to figure out how to give myself the option. Okay. And I actually made a strategic mistake. Um because I at the time I graduated from Columbia, I also graduated that summer with a master's from Middlebury in French. Wow. Because I did their I did their summer program. Uh-huh. Um and ended up with like the right number of credits, you know, the summer after my undergraduate. So So instead of like, you know, applying for the first year of a master's program, I applied directly to the second year. And a lot of people do this, especially if they have like a four year bachelor's degree, or if they did some graduate level work, a lot of people will apply to an M2, a master two, like I did. Okay. Um, it's becoming more common for programs to just admit you for the full two years, but at the time you could choose if you were applying to, you know, first year or second year and you mm-hmm. could switch programs. And, um, but this was actually a strategic mistake because, which I didn't know about at the time, because if you do two years of a master's program in France and you earn a degree from a French university, you can, uh, get a visa. Mm-hmm. Um, for another for an additional year to find a job oh. now at the time at the time you had to like apply for the visa right away and it was a little bit more complicated they've really simplified it now okay um 
but you can get basically an extra year. So if you want to stay in France, you can hunt for a job, get hired, and then switch your visa status to like a work visa that is more permanent. And there are fewer hoops for companies to jump through. Like they don't have to sponsor you in the same way that they would if they they were trying to hire you from the U.S. The U.S. Ah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. So it worked out for you in that you were able to have this experience, even if it was a mistake and, you know, you were able to have this experience, but this kind of segues into what you do now, which is helping people actually uh, fulfill their dreams. So tell me a little more about how you started um, the website once you were, and the business once you were settled into France. Sure. So um, one of the things that people would always ask me when I was majoring in French was, you know, what are you going to do? And they would immediately follow up with, um, are you going to be a French teacher? Mm, of course. And this question, like, super annoyed me. <laughs> <laughs> and, at first, and at first I was like, yeah, I want to be a French teacher. Like, I really loved school. I liked yeah. the teachers. I liked learning. Um, I considered doing a doctorate at one point. Um, But I didn't, like, necessarily feel like the vocation for becoming a teacher. Uh Um, And so finally I got snarky and I was like, you know what? I'm going to speak French professionally. Uh (laughs) And I said that totally as a joke, but Uh honestly, like, that's kind of what I do. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, All the time for your clients, right? (laughs) All the time for my clients. I mean, I write things in French for them. I deal with French administration for them. And so what happened was, you know, I came first as a study abroad student and second as, you know, completely on my own. Mm -hmm. And the first time when you're a study abroad student, like the program takes care of everything. They find housing for you. Mm -hmm. They help if there's, you know, the circuit breaker has gone out and I have no electricity. Mm -hmm. Like you just tell them. And even if you, you know, you can say it in English if you want, and they take care of it. And and you're very much like in that, you know, student bubble, bubble, especially (laughs) when you're in an American program. Yeah. And so then when I came back, like I did have the luck of the university helping me with the housing, but I had to do everything else myself. I had to enroll in university. I had to enroll in classes. I had Mm -hmm. to figure out my health insurance. I had to, um, you know, set up my own phone contract, like all of these different things that honestly, I had never done them in English. Of course. Yeah. A grown up. (laughs) (laughs) Things are so much easier in the U S (laughs) really. Well, yeah, maybe, but I mean, I had never like adulted in the U S properly. Mm, like I yeah. had been, I had been a university student, but it's similar. Like you're in the dorm and they fix things for you. And, yeah. um, you know, you don't have to, you know, especially like I didn't have to deal with immigration. Like obviously mm-hmm. there are foreign students who, yeah. who do have to deal with those things. But, um, yeah. So I started like writing about how to do this because I thought, okay, I, I explored my options for for graduate school after um, after after gra- or you know when I was a senior. Mm-hmm. Um, I wasn't only looking at programs in Paris, but I looked at a couple of American university programs. I looked at continuing a master's at Columbia, a couple of other schools, and a master's degree at the time was over forty thousand dollars cash like no financial aid for master's program at the time right at the time so i'm sure that i'm sure it's like sixty thousand now i have actually no idea and i don't want to know exactly um (laughs) and um i hope you're sitting down because i came to france i enrolled in a master's program one year of tuition plus one year of health insurance as a student i was 22 452 euros (laughs) Imagine that. That's not even, ima- no, I, I'm not going to like date myself and tell you, like I was a foreign student in Boston. I can't even tell you how much we were paying per credit. And it, you know, oh it yeah. It was pretty oh, close to that imagine. just for one credit. Yeah. So imagine. Like 400, 450 euros, like barely pays for the books for a class. Exactly. Right now. It's true. Wow. So, um, yeah. So I was shocked. I mean, I, and I knew this going in too. I knew it wasn't expensive, but Mm -hmm. like, I was like, there's not expensive. And then there's just dirt cheap, right? (laughs) 
Right. And I was like, <laughs> why aren't more people doing this? Why yeah. are people paying 40,000 euros or dollars to come do, you know, insert name of American college or university in Paris program for, you know, Less, literally a yeah. hundred times as much. Exactly. Um, you, you, you brought up another really good point there because you think to yourself, like when that, when you experienced it, you say to yourself, how come nobody knows this? Which kind of reflects back on what we're led to believe. Like in the U S there's some things that you just, you can't believe that it's actually better as far as like costs and everything elsewhere, especially in Europe. Right. Because your sense yeah. of what was there, it's like, oh, my God, you might as well say you're living in Switzerland for, you know, for how you think right. how expensive it is. So you question why and people doing this and look where it got you, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I actually started out by like, I bet more people would know about this because like, I mean, I came from a, you know, solidly middle class family, mm -hmm. um, you know, like. I got, you know, I was on financial aid mm -hmm. at school. Mm -hmm. um, I was very fortunate in that um, a school like Columbia with a big endowment was able to meet the financial need mm -hmm. after the, you know, after the FAFSA calculation, whatever, whatever voodoo they do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I was very fortunate to get quite a bit of financial aid when I was yeah. at Columbia. Yeah. And like, I wouldn't have been able to, you know, I was paying my own way. I was mm -hmm. paying my own way. Like when I was studying abroad, you know, I did the Tepif program that gave me my pocket money. Mm -hmm. When I moved, when I moved back after, um, you know, after graduation and I was enrolling in my master's program, I was doing Tepif. I was teaching and getting a, you know, small monthly stipend. Mm -hmm. I was staying at this, I was staying at this apartment where I was like, basically babysitting or, you know, supervising yeah. uh, children yeah. after yeah. school to uh. like, you know, and, and that, that came off my rent. Like yeah. it made that I had a one, a really cheap rent and two that I didn't, even the rent that I paid was reduced accordingly by the number of hours I spent right. like taking care of the kids. Yeah. So I was very, I mean, I was very lucky, but I was also, you know, paying my own way, which yeah. a lot of people in my program were not doing. Yeah. Um, great for you know great for them they had a lot of wonderful different experiences but for me like i figured out like way more people would be studying abroad if they realized that they could do it so cheaply yeah um but i mean the downside obviously is you have to do it all yourself and when yes. you're in a forty thousand dollar program mm -hmm. they help you with the visa they help you with the housing they uh -huh. take care of your health care they enroll you in the classes. They yeah. smooth things over if there's any conflict with any of your professors. Yeah. Um, they have their own they have their own internal grading system. So if yeah. you get like a twelve in the French system out of twenty, that somehow converts to an A minus. Like <laughs> okay. um, very different. <laughs> so yeah, I mean it's not like you know, there there are things that the program is doing for you, but um yeah, so I just thought, like, okay, so what do people know if they need to do this, if, mm -hmm. if they want to do this, if they want to study abroad and pay for their own way, what do they need to know? And I started writing it out. Mm -hmm. And originally, my plan was, I'm going to write this as a book, I'm going to pitch publishers, it's going to be like a travel guide. Yeah. Um, and um, then I thought, well you know, the information is going to change yes. relatively frequently. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I decided, well, I'll just like put it on a website and either charge a membership fee or like at the time it was sort of like on the tail end of Google ads where you could just put up a blog, throw some Google ads on there and like, you know, make a thousand dollars a month, like yeah. twiddling your thumbs just yeah. by having ads on your site. Like, yeah. That doesn't work. And, you know, it didn't no, work it does not. by the time I started <laughs> doing it. <laughs> um, but at the beginning, like the, you know, the bloggers that I was following, like that had been their strategy to grow their business like five years earlier. And exactly. so if I had been five years, you know, five years older then it might've worked. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, it's true. It's true. I found that out too when I started the blog. Is you know you follow them and it's like yeah, it worked then, but by then it was too saturated. It just didn't work anymore. <laughs> yeah, and I mean social and social media was starting. Like I think Facebook had opened up to everybody, but there weren't like Facebook groups yet. There weren't 
Um, there weren't a lot of forums. There weren't like the French websites mm -hmm. were terrible. They have gotten mm. so much better in even the past two years because of COVID. Um, ah. But like you could not find information about anything related to French administration online mm. 10, 12 years ago. Like, yeah. If you found it, it was outdated. It was yeah. wrong. It was incomplete. Um, and especially if and, you didn't speak the language and you Google translate it, I can just imagine, or you even try yep. to translate it. Yep. Yep. So, so. <laughs> so I started writing about how to do this and I turned it into a website and I kind of like sat on my thumbs for a bit and waited for the money from Google ads to roll in, which didn't of course. work, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I kind of, you know, started following like these different online business people and trying to figure out, you know, how I could turn this into services, you know, like I, I had a couple of books that I wrote. Like I think, um, when Amazon first started letting you self publish, mm -hmm. um, I published a book or two, you know, like a short book or two. Yes. Um, one was called, you know, how to save $40,000 studying abroad in France. Um, and at the time I was targeting like helping students with enrolling independently in French graduate programs okay. and doing the student visa stuff. Okay. Now the problem is when you are targeting a market who, or demographic who is trying to save $40,000 doing yeah. something, yeah. um, because they are poor students, exactly. um, they don't always have money for a consultation. So yeah. like the first couple of years of my business, like I had a really hard time figuring out what I was doing wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and mostly like, you know, I was meeting with people for free mm -hmm. um, and I still, I still do that, but yeah. I was basically like, okay, we need to do this and we need to do that. And we need to do ABC in this order. And here's how you can work with me and help me do it. And so yeah. they would be like, okay, great, thanks. And then I would and never then, hear from them again. And they course. would go off and do it themselves. Of course. <laughs> um, People look for free information. And I still, I, I understand what you're saying perfectly. Because I think we read parallel ways, different countries, but kind of like the same thing. Yeah, so... You know, it's very easy for people, like you said, who are looking to save money and they know they can get free information. And it's uh, sort of like, yeah, and after it's done, it's like, well, okay, thanks and goodbye. See you. <laughs> Never. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you had to, you yeah. had to rework your, your. Um... So I had to rework a little bit, like what I was, what I was providing. And I, I, I wiggled around a few different ways. One was like, I started providing like, you know, packages of you could buy like five hours of mm -hmm. administrative assistance from me, like for help with different, um, you know, different French admin things. Mm -hmm. um, except the problem with that is I'm sure this is similar in Spain is that everything takes like so One thing a day. <laughs> long. <laughs> One thing well, every three weeks. Come back, staff, <laughs> come back again. And yeah. <laughs> right. And so what would happen, what would happen then um, was, you know, something like signing up for health insurance, right? Mm -hmm. The form takes like five minutes to fill out. It's basically mm -hmm. just your personal information. It takes 10 minutes to photocopy the documents and stick it in the mail. Okay. Like you yeah. need to attach your visa, your lease, yeah. your passport, your birth certificate. Mm -hmm. And that's like, you stick it in, you stick it in the mail and they start the process to sign you up. Yeah. That takes like, maybe half an hour to do all of those things put together yeah but then but then you wait and then two and a half months later you're going to get a thing back in the mail and you're going to have to respond and send something back and then three months after that you're going to get another letter and you're going to have to send something back and so and then two months after that you'll get congratulations you're now enrolled in french healthcare. um you know please send us a photo for your card and also you know now you can start getting reimbursed for medical care. And so then there's other forms to fill out. Like, okay, uh -huh. like here are the, here are the forms saying like who my med sans is, like my, yeah. my primary care doctor. Yeah. So the paperwork itself takes a very small amount of time, but managing that for somebody through a period of six months or yeah. more, Kinda plus yeah. like, plus managing their emotions about yeah. it too, because yeah. like when exactly. people, 
you know, like I have clients even right now who are like, okay, we did this six months ago. Why don't I have a response? Yeah. Like, what are you, what are you <laughs> like doing? It's up to you. And I'm like, <laughs> right. Like it's up to me. And like, dude, I can't call, like you, you cannot do this. You cannot call French, you know, the French healthcare number every day and say, is there an update? Why hasn't it moved yet? Like exactly. what's going on? It doesn't is there anything work I can that do? Way. Can we yeah. speed up the process? Like, <laughs> um, you know, what's your, what's your name? Who's yeah. your manager? Can I yeah. talk to a manager? Like yeah. that does not it doesn't work, work no. at all. <laughs> no. And so like, I wasn't accounting in my pricing you know, mm-hmm. one, how long this would take in time yeah. Two, like all of the emotional work that would go along with it. And three, like, you know, I was getting, you know, clients would pay me for like five hours of my time in September. And then mm-hmm. the following July, I was still doing work for them. Exactly. Like it, it wasn't a good, uh, a good scheme. So now you have to reinvent it again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what I started doing, um, and at the time I also like, I became, um, I became an administrator of the Facebook group Americans in France. Okay. And, um, over time, um, you know, I became more and more active. Like I was answering a lot of people, you know, everybody's questions and trying to just really help. And I was seeing like hundreds of these different circumstances of people in different, you know, going to different consulates, going to mm-hmm. different um, prefectures in France, going to different, you know, registering for healthcare with in different regions mm-hmm. and all of these different things and helping people with a wide variety of scenarios and um you know researching answers for them and uh you know doing whatever i could to help basically and i sort of slowly took um took over the group and then um with started pro- you know started promoting my stuff um mm-hmm. my stuff more mm-hmm. and you know obviously the most questions we get about anything are visas mm-hmm. and so in 2019, um, you know, I had started, I had started helping other people with other visa issues. Um, you know, I had started out with student visas and then people started asking me about, um, well, how did you start your business and how do you get a visa to start a business and things like that? So I was kind of already helping people with visa things. Mm -hmm. Um, and I did a couple of them and then I wrote my book, um, based on, uh, helping all of, you know, seeing the questions that came up. Okay. Tell tell me the name of that book. Everybody across France. (laughs) So the name of the book is Foolproof French Visas. And it was first released in 2019. And then I released, um, I updated it in 2020 and I just updated it in January, 2022. Um, so it's now about three times as long and more yeah, detailed so, as, yeah, the, exactly. as the first edition. <laughs> yeah, but it's great that you keep it updated so that they can get up to the minute information, which is very important right. because as you know, things change constantly. They change constantly. They change from one visa applicant to another. They change from one prefecture to another. Um, they constantly like invent new systems and processes like, oh, you know, now you have to submit that document online to mm-hmm. be approved before mm-hmm. you can uh, you know, before you can submit it to the consulate and, um, before you could have this type of health insurance and now you need that type of health insurance and you used to be able to change from this status to that status, but now you have to go back home and you have to reapply with a new status. And so Mm -hmm. like, I really wanted to give people a comprehensive overview of, okay, if you want to stay in France long-term and I tell my clients, like, let's say that even if you don't think you want to stay in France long term, yeah. I want you to plan like you're going to stay here forever because mm-hmm. it's way easier to do it like that than to, than to oh, get okay. here for three years on temporary visas and then decide you want to stay and then decide like, okay, you have to find work or you have to start a business or like change your status or something yeah. in order to be able to stay. Like that's yeah. an administrative nightmare. And I do it for people. I have two clients right now that I'm that I'm working with on on changing their status so they can do other things, but Mm. it's much better to, um, to start as you mean to continue. Yeah. Um, That makes sense. So, yeah. So, so the book goes through like, okay, if you have X visa type, here are the tax implications. Here's Mm -hmm. where you need to be reporting your income. Mm -hmm. Here's the type of work that you're allowed to do and for whom, um, you know, one of the topics that comes up a ton is, 
can I work remotely in France? Well, yeah. not in the way that you, you think? Not, the, not in the way that you think about working remotely. Uh-huh. Like you cannot be an employee for a U.S. based company and get paid for U.S. you know into a U.S. account while sitting in a computer in France and thinking that you don't exactly. owe exactly any taxes. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> And thinking and thinking that the business is not going to owe France any taxes for having employees and undeclared business activity uh, in France. Exactly. So, you know, like, like basically trying to answer all the questions that people have, but also the questions that they don't know, they don't know to ask. Makes sense because really a lot of people, and I think, you know, for a lot of countries, it's something that they're all struggling with, like how to, it's the same in Spain, how to account for digital nomads and all those people that come and do remote work. It's such a, a gray area because it's, it's kind of a new phenomenon, but it's going to be really interesting, you know, what comes out of it. And I don't know what right. the countries are going to do to tackle that because at some point it's going to become such a huge thing because now everybody sells the idea. You can work from anywhere. Yay. <laughs> you know? Right. And, and a lot of people and a lot of people got away with it for a very long time. Because yeah. There aren't really, I mean, remote work really for most places, like I was doing Zoom before it was cool, right? Like I started mm-hmm. this business around um, 2013-ish. Um, I started doing it and I was basically on Zoom from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Now, um, a lot of people have been getting away with remote work mm-hmm. because like officially... You know, there's nothing against it. But if you Mm -hmm. look at like the tax treaties and what the tax treaties say and like what qualifies as work and what qualifies as working in France, um, you know, it's very clear. And I think, you know, there are some countries right now, like Croatia, I think, just um, issued their first digital nomad visa Mm -hmm. um, last year. And it's a development that I am following closely, obviously. But a lot of people who have been getting away with it have been promoting this idea that it's easy to do and, you know, there's no problem. Some of them get caught and they get very big fines. And I know of more than one person um, through secondhand stories who has had to leave France because they got caught in a big Mm -hmm. tax nightmare after after doing something like that. Um, But I mean, the thing about the thing about the the digital nomad visa, for example, let's Croatia. you basically have a visitor visa for for one year, which is a visa that exists in France also. Yeah. But you're not in the tax system. You're not in the healthcare system. You don't have the. I I think you can renew it. I'm not sure if there's a maximum for Croatia how many yeah. times you can renew. Yeah. But yeah. it doesn't provide any kind of long term path to being mm-hmm. able to stay more than a couple years. Yeah. Um. You're never going to become a permanent resident. You're never going to become a citizen. Yeah. And so one thing that I really discourage is, you know, I have clients, I have a lot of clients who are retired who want to retire in France mm-hmm. and they get visitor visas. And I tell them from the beginning, like, look, and this is in my book also, like you're, if you're on a visitor visa, especially if your income is like U.S. pensions and social security mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. U- and U.S. investment income. You're never going to be paying tax income taxes into the French system. Um, you're basically never going to like meet any of the requirements for applying for for ten year residency or naturalization. Mm-hmm. Now, some places in France will, if somebody renews a visitor visa for X number of years, certain in certain places they will use their discretion to give you a multi-year visa. Uh-huh. But it's not at all a right yeah. or an obligation for them to do that. Yeah. So you could be going you could be going to renew your yearly visitor visa like when you're 95. Yeah. Really? Um, Instead of just and, doing it the right way from the beginning. Well, I mean that could be the right way for people who are actually who are actually retired and who don't want to work, like they could you know that could be the right way for them. Yeah. But, um, you know, they're never going to get a French passport if they never paid income taxes into the system for at least a couple of years. So I really encourage people to think twice. Like, if you think you want to stay long term, um, are you 
giving yourself a path to residency and a path to citizenship if that's something that you want to apply for. So that's something that like every, there's 27 visa types covered in my book Mm -hmm. for every single type, Mm -hmm. you know, yes, this visa accumulates and count towards, you know, residency and naturalization or no, this one doesn't, you're going to have to go home or you're going to have to start over or whatever. And that book again is called Foolproof French Visa. So it's it sounds like a good read for anybody who's thinking about doing this. And it's part of your information as to like what you need to get yourself there. Now, was that at the same time that you, because I know you have a second book, The, the Five Decisions uh, Big Dreamers Make Before Their Transformation? Yes. When did that come about? Is that was that written at the same time, or was it a, a different um, time setting for that? Um, it was written after the first edition of Foolproof French Visas, and I wanted to write something a little bit more inspirational. Okay, because I think what can happen is like people, you know, like me, Americans who want to move to Paris, like we do so because we have um, we have a love of France. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, it's we we as as Americans, like we really romanticize yeah. um France and France and living and, and and the French and I mean they're they're kind of like our older sibling that we you know, we love to hate them, but I mean we love them. Yeah. Um and <laughs> You wanna experience at, it. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And I mean we, and our histories are profoundly linked. I mean, mm-hmm. the, you know, the French, the, America would, the United States would not have won the American Revolution if we hadn't had the support of the French Navy yeah. um, and, and Lafayette. Yeah. And then I learned this, um, we were at the Normandy beaches um, mm-hmm. a couple of weeks ago. And um, in during World War One, when the Americans, landed on French soil to yep. go to the Battle of the Thumb. Um, yes. Pershing said, Lafayette, we are here. And and then there's, you know, obviously the the uh, the D Day landings where yep. um, six thousand Americans died on died on D Day. Um, and hundred and thirty four thousand Americans died in the Battle of Normandy, the three yep. month battle um, that ended in the liberation of Paris. Yeah. Um, so, you know, where don't forget the Statue of Liberty as their thanks, right? And, and the, <laughs> right. And the Statue of, and the Statue of Liberty. So, yeah. you know, as the, the French are the, the oldest and deepest allies of the Americans, but yeah. I mean, we are also the, you know, the champions of, the French and yes. um, you know, we don't, we don't always agree. And I think there's, there are some cultural differences about friendship be- between um, you know, f- Americans tend to think like, okay, if somebody is your friend, they're always supporting you. Whereas the French um, concept of friendship is more like, okay, you know, if somebody's really my friend, then I need to tell them when they're being stupid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, yeah. They're a little more forthright then. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like there's, there's definitely like in, in France, if somebody's truly your friend, like you're going to correct, you know, you're going to yeah. correct them or you're going to say like, Hey, you're being an idiot right now. Yep, exactly. And so that, like, you know, that, that causes a little bit of conflict, I think between our, our two countries. And, you know, there, there were, we, we remember the era of, freedom fries <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> um in in the early 2000s but um i i forget where i was going with this oh i was i was talking about my my book the book, my other yes. book. Uh-huh. so i just wanted to write something a little bit more inspirational that like you know if you are a person who has a dream of moving to france and you're going to be pursuing these dream you know this dream Like there are going to be a lot of challenges along the way. Like you're at some point, you know, you're going to have some French administrative thing that is just not going to work and it's going to really frustrate you and you're not going to be able to figure out why. And it's going to take six months for no reason. And, you know, and you're going to get, and you're going to get to France and things are going to be great for the first year. And then, you know, you're away from from your family. (laughs) Um, You're in like 
Paris where it rains all the time in the winter and it's kind of mm-hmm. depressing and it gets dark at four o'clock. Exactly. Um, you know, you're going to get frustrated because, you know, there are these cultural differences that you just don't understand and mm-hmm. you can't, and you can't figure it out. And then you're going to go on a group for support and like some, you know, idiot who's been here for 30 years is going to say, well, if you don't like it, you just have to go home. Exactly. Like, Come <laughs> I hear on. that all the time. I like, <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I outlaw that. I outlaw that in my group. Like yeah. I give people warnings and, or even potentially kick them out for saying that in my group because everybody gets frustrated. Like, you know what? France is kind of a hard place to live. Like French, like the French can be, I love the, I love the French. Mm-hmm. I just, you know, told you how much I love the French and love living in France, but French people can be really obnoxious and difficult at times. Yeah, um, but you've got to. And I mean, I'm sure that I can be. I can be really obnoxious and difficult at times. So exactly, you know, I, you know, you can love living in a place and love the people I and still, still like, yeah, exactly. you know, want to vent your frustration like yeah. among people who have experienced the same thing. So exactly, they just don't realize. That. I think, yeah, they get jaded, and it's it's sort of like they they take it out on everybody else that's still looking to move, and that's normal for every place. And it's so nice that you have this book saying, "Look, it's going to be like this, but you can do it." You know, you are like the champion yeah. of you know, encouragement, which is great. Yeah, yeah, and I, I mean, I really started a couple of years ago, especially during COVID, because mm-hmm. my business, I, I released full for French visas in September. 2019 I think September 1st 2019 mm-hmm. and I mean honestly like that was the best thing that happened to my business because like all of these people bought my book um they really felt that the information was comprehensive and that mm-hmm. they could trust me to provide accurate information and to help them through the process and so I started getting like a lot more clients than mm-hmm. I had previously Mm -hmm. um who wanted my help specifically because they had read my book and and knew that I would support them yeah and um then COVID hit yeah (laughs) like March 20 March 2020 I literally had um I had one client go to uh her visa appointment on like March 4th she got her visa back in the mail on March 11th and March 13th everything shut down and then I had another (laughs) client who had her visa appointment on March 12th and March 13th everybody everything shut down her passport sat in the French embassy in Washington with her visa application Jesus for 453 days imagine that i i think i would just die you know because there's something you need to have next to you you know within i said all the time (sighs) right and so (laughs) yeah so so march 13th everything like borders shut down um visa applications reopened for americans on uh june 9th 2021 so it was 453 days uh, I believe I did. The, I did the calculation. Mm-hmm. I met. I met with clients on June 9th to make their visa appointments. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I was getting new clients throughout that whole time. I yeah. actually had the best year in my business when oh. France, you know, to that point yeah. when France was completely shut down. But I mean, putting like putting out that positive, you know, inspirational book and really thinking about what it meant to support somebody through their dreams like that Mm -hmm. um, really helped me to be able to sort of provide that container for all of those clients who were really struggling during that time. Like, you know, I want to move to France, but all of a sudden, like it's on hold. It's on, you know, we don't know when the border is going to open up. Like we don't know. Um, There were so many changes to travel regulations during Mm -hmm. that time. Like, you know, even French, like even French people who lived outside of France couldn't travel into France at yeah, one point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was just really, I, it was I, really hard for a lot of people. But but at the same time, like, you know, it, it was different from people who were traveling, right? Like, if you're planning to travel on a trip to Paris and it gets canceled because of the global pandemic, like, mm-hmm. you might not book that trip until five years later. Exactly. But, but you if your still. lifelong dream is moving, you know, moving to France, then like almost every single one of my clients was like, as soon as things open up, like, you because know, I'm, really, I'm at the first visa appointment. Exactly. Because really, I think that lockdown and the whole world stopping really 
you know, stimulated a lot of minds because before COVID you were like, ah, you know, it's a dream I have. I'll do it someday. I'll do it someday. But I think what COVID showed us is that you really can't plan for tomorrow as much as you think, exactly. you know, you don't know what's going to happen. And then you're thinking, should I stay in my safe little cocoon or should I venture out and do something that I've always wanted to do forever because nothing is guaranteed. And I think when people have that much time to think, you think to yourself, you know what? I got to do it, you know, because yeah, really, yeah. <laughs> what's right. like I've been, you know, I've been putting off, I've been putting off dreams. You know, people think I've been putting off dreams for years and you know, I used to think, oh, I could do this any time, but exactly. what this has showed us is, no, we actually can't do it. <laughs> no, you can't. And nothing, <laughs> and nothing's guaranteed. Yeah. And you know, if you have an opportunity to do something, then grab you know. life by the balls. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, Allison, you know, let, let's wrap this up by you telling me again what the books are, what your um, website is, so that anybody who wants information, and I'll also have it on the show notes, but please, you know, give us an idea, uh, give us the information again as to what the website's in sure. there. Okay. So um, my two books are uh, The Five Decisions Big Dreamers Make Before Their Transformation. And that one is an inspirational book. If you're thinking about moving to France, you know, it's only seven, I think $7 on, on Amazon. You know, if you're thinking about moving to France or taking some kind of big leap in your life and you're not sure if you're ready to do that, um, it can be a little bit of an inspirational book to get you ready and to think about the things that you want to do in order to prepare. Um, my other book is Foolproof French Visas. Uh, the current edition is the Complete 2022 edition, uh, which is available on Amazon as well in paperback and it's available on my website as an ebook. Um, and yep. my website is your France formation, your France formation. Um, and that is for my company. It, it talks about the services we offer. We have two online courses. We have uh, these books. Um, I also have a podcast profiles in France formation where we talk to, I talk to people who have moved to France at various points in their lives. Some of them are my clients. Some of them have been here for years and years. And we talk about their experiences, the challenges that they face, like what they really love about living here, what, what can be difficult about living here, um, and, and things like that. So those are all of the things I do. And obviously, I provide services helping people to uh, get the right visa, move to France, and move to France to create their dream life. That's fantastic because really, you know, from talking to you and hearing what you have to say, it's obvious that you're not like a pump and dump because, you know, the internet is full of so many stories, shysters, whatever it is, you know, but you can tell yeah. this is somebody who really cares, who has your back and who's going to. Yeah. And what I find, at least for me, that I see a lot of is like, you know, everybody can get information, you know whether it's YouTube or Google or whatever it is. But when it comes to time to actually make the right decision, you can either go for the free and take your chances. I'm yeah. not saying you can't do it alone or whatever it is, or you can actually pay for information. Yeah. Nothing is ever free. And that's something I keep saying over and over again, because if you think that somebody who's done it, you know, and who charges for their services, can't offer yeah. you anything and you think, oh, I'm going to do it. And you want to cobble together information from here and there and there and try to make a hole. Well, don't come crying at the end because really yeah. something worth it, you've got to pay for it. And people don't understand that. And it's a sharing economy. Yeah. Well, tough cacas. It's, you know, this is life. You have to right. do something. Well, and that's the thing. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, I know there's one website right now where, um, like, I'm, I'm not going to name it obviously, mm -hmm. but like literally out of, they have four writers and like, or five writers and three of them have moved to France like this year. Two, day, two days so, ago. <laughs> yeah. Like one of them, <laughs> right. Like one of them was literally like, literally, um, you know, moved here like in February. So like you have absolutely no business. No, not helping, helping anybody or, 
or or criticizing like the service that I provide. Exactly. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I mean like you know, I've been I've also been an administrator of the Americans in France Facebook group since 2013. Mm-hmm. Um so I have answered like I have I've answered literally like tens of thousands of questions for people in different situations and I've pretty much like seen it all at this yeah, point. Exactly. Um you know, so it's like okay, you know, everybody has to start somewhere yeah. and that's fine. Um but you know, and I certainly like, you know, I've made my share of mistakes in the beginning. Yeah. Um and uh you know but but this is important and it, like sometimes if you screw it up yeah like you can't go back You're and fix it exactly <laughs> yeah yeah like this is you know this is your life yeah. and so um yeah i mean i started i had um i had about a year and a half of experience doing taxes like international mm-hmm. taxes um for a tax firm now mm-hmm. i am not an accountant it is very decidedly not my thing mm-hmm. but it did teach me enough about how those things you know how the overall system is set up yes yeah. so that you know one i can answer questions about like how does making this choice impact my ability to stay and live and work in france whatever okay. and two like you know here are the questions you need to ask yourself and the questions you need to talk to your accountant about uh-huh. because these are going to be deciding factors in whether you move to france whether you establish yourself as a as a resident here and what the consequences are for doing that. And, yeah. you know, the unforeseen consequences can be. Yeah. And they, and they won't help you at that point, because by that time, guess what? That person that you listen to who gave it free or for less than you're giving it will now be back in the U S or wherever, because they screwed up their own things too. Or sometimes as you've seen on YouTube, it's, it's funny. Like a lot of the YouTubers that are in Mexico or whatever, they give all this advice. They've been there five minutes. They give advice on how mm. to move there. And then it turns out that they never even bothered getting there residency papers or anything so they get kicked out and you're like <laughs> you know, yep. well i moved here because of you well you know what you gotta do your research and i'm sorry if it's yeah. good information you need to pay for it that's just the way it is you have to invest yeah, something it, in you know for yourself exactly and i mean like we said earlier you know these things have changed multiple times yeah um you know i've been doing this for i've been writing about it answering questions about it in various capacities for about nine years um and things have changed a lot for mm-hmm. almost every single visa type that's out there. Like there are visa types that don't exist anymore. Exactly. There are visa types where the requirements have changed. Yeah. Um, you know, there were visa types where you used to have to um, provide a copy of your first grade teacher's comments on your report card. <laughs> and now you have to, but now you have to provide a sample of your great grandmother's DNA. Exactly. And, uh, <laughs> It's you like know, somebody like, sits there and go, what can we do to them today? <laughs> you know? Right, right. And I mean, the thing that people like, again, Americans are very privileged. And I, I think in our relationship with France and that one, a lot of French people want to move to the US. Mm-hmm. So France issues a lot of visas to Americans and it mm-hmm. can be like a much more forgiving for Americans than, you know, for some other nationalities. We have, a, yeah. we have a, like, I will not underestimate the, the privilege that we have in this process but mm-hmm. um you know it is the same process for everybody and there are certain like things. you know uh, certain things that mm-hmm. um you know you, they you must do you must follow you must you know it's whether yeah, or not you're yeah. american yeah exactly exactly and so yeah i mean like having you know when you get advice like i said for or like we've both been saying free and you don't know who's giving the advice. You don't mm-hmm. know how long they've been here, when, when they got their visa, when, um, you know, whether they've helped any other people with your visa type. Exactly. Um, you you know, get what whether you pay for. <laughs> you, get, you get what you pay for. You get what you pay for. And if somebody like, you know, my, <laughs> somebody, somebody, again, I won't need names, like somebody yeah. like bought my book and then was like doing a YouTube video series of like, there are 27 visa types. Exactly. Go through all of them. I'm like, <laughs> Okay, well, 
I guess like imitation is the highest form of flattery. Exactly. But, like, come on. <laughs> but who's going to get screwed in the end? So everybody listening, if you right. have your dreams of moving to France, I mean, this is a great resource for you right here. Go to Franceformation.com. That's Franceformation.com. Your, your Franceformation.com. Your, oh, I'm sorry. Yourfranceformation.com. That's Yourfranceformation.com. Get all the information that you can. She's got blog posts. She's got the podcast. You can get in touch with her. And if you're serious about moving, moving to France, this is invaluable to you as your resource and your person, your go-to and somebody who's going to have your back through the whole process. And so definitely check it out. And Alison, thank you so much for being on the show because, you know, you have provided really, really good information for people and anybody who's wise will do their homework and their due diligence and know that this website of yours and the books that you have are great places to start their research. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. It has been really fun. Uh, <laughs> and Thanks. yeah, I will look forward from hearing from any to hearing from anybody who would like to pursue their dream of moving to France. Great. I want you to have the best transformation and transformation. I love the name, by the way. So. Thank you. <laughs> Once again, everybody, thank you so much for listening. And we'll see you on the next show. Bye. Bye.